So if I may start just with a short um, uh, a brief summary of some of the issues, I think that that's important. So I'll begin. Securing Aboriginal water rights is an imperative. It is absolutely vital to addressing Aboriginal disadvantage. It is a vital step towards closing the disgraceful gap in Aboriginal health and wealth status. Aquinellius is the fiction that the First Peoples of this country have no property rights in water, aside from that in native title, no place in the prosperity that flows from water rights, and a minor role in the management of Australia's water landscapes. I contend there is no place for attitudes like this in Australia today. As any thinking person knows, as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples affirms, Aboriginal water rights are a basic human right. The right to water must be recognised as a standalone human right in international and domestic law. We are all diminished when human rights are denied. For Aboriginal people, the land and the water are one, and both are intertwined with Aboriginal laws and culture. This is the essence of Aboriginality. Aboriginal people have looked after this country, its landscapes and its waterscapes for tens of thousands of years, and looked after it very well. For too long, this went unrecognised and unacknowledged. The rivers, the creeks, lakes and billabongs, the swamps and soaks teemed with waterfowl, fish and turtles. Bush foods and medicine plants abounded. The historical and official diaries of the First Fleet officers testify and particularise the considerable wealth in water soil and resources. It took some time for this land to be recognised as one of the biodiversity hotspots on the planet. This natural heritage is the legacy of thousands of years of superior land management by Aboriginal peoples. But it wasn't long before things began to change. The legacy the settlers and colonisation resulted in polluted waters, extinction of our plants and animals, the introduction of foreign pests and weeds which spread across the lands and the waters. The other legacy was stolen lands and stolen waters. Murders, rapes, massacres, introduced diseases and government policies of domination and oppression. The Bringing Them Home report evidenced the generation of stolen children, suppressed language, racism and the impact of the white Australia policies. The whole sad story. I don't need to elaborate any further. Things began to change for the better through the legal recognition of Aboriginal title by the Mabo decision. The High Court recognition in WIC of the coexistence of pastoral leases and native title. Australian society became more aware of the exercise of human rights in the application of the Commonwealth Racial Discrimination Act. There was a sense of hope for the future, that a new chapter was opening, that the page was being turned on past wrongs. The incorporation of international human rights principles into Australian law created an obligation to protect the rights of all peoples. The introduction of the 10-point plan by the Australian Parliament promised bucket loads of extinguishment in an effort to reverse the decision of the High Court. Later, when that same parliament passed legislation to create a new tradable property right in water and to separate water titles from land titles, it failed to consider Aboriginal water rights. The powerful sector interest groups, farmers and irrigators, water-hungry industries, towns and cities, <coughs> Many had their water licences converted into water property rights. But once again, Aboriginal people missed out. Aboriginal communities through remote and regional Australia continue to suffer poor water quality and inadequate water infrastructure, which impacts their health and quality of life. 
How do we address these injustices? What can be done to ensure Aboriginal water rights and interests get due fair recognition? I argue that a paradigm shift is required, that aqua nullius must be overturned through a system of reserved Aboriginal water rights. This is a First Nation right, allocated before and above that of other stakeholders. Overturning Aquinalius provides the legal case and the human rights case for Aboriginal water rights. It argues from an Aboriginal perspective that Aboriginal water rights is a human rights imperative. It is a book every legal academic and law student should read, a book that anyone concerned with human rights, law or native title should read. It is my hope this book will drive the Aboriginal Water Rights Dialogue into the political mainstream, and I commend it to you.